a real pleasure to introduce uh, Dennis Trapakin, who's going to give us a talk today. And many of you already know Dennis. He's actually been at MRI uh, many times before. He's actually worked here and done experiments here. Today he's going to come back uh, to give us a talk about some of the uh, kind of an overview of the work that he's done that's bridged computational and um, laboratory approaches to understanding our science problems. Uh, just by way of introduction, Dennis did his bachelor's degree in mathematics at Samara State University in Russia, and um, he excelled in his undergrad work. He won a number of awards there, including uh, student regional conference presentations. Uh, more notably, he won the presidential scholarship in Russia in uh, 2012. He won um, the regional young scientist contest in Russia as well. After his, after his undergrad work, uh, Dennis's mentor in mathematics there recommended him to Leonid Kalachuk, who's many of you know, he's a colleague of ours, he's an affiliate faculty member of McLaughlin, and uh, chair of the, the mathematics department at the University of Montana. And Dennis went on to do his graduate studies at the University of Montana, and he worked with, uh, with Leonid on a number of problems, complex problems involving modeling, uh, very complex systems that had multiple parameters. And as you know, those are oftentimes the kind of problems that we have to approach as neuroscientists to understand things like interactions of complex networks of genes, for example, all the way down to the level of molecules in the brain and how subtle changes in structure from mutations, for example, can lead to subtle functional changes and to be able to understand the effects of those downstream on behavior, disease processes, it's really important to have uh, sophisticated mathematical approaches to do that. Uh, so Dennis finished his PhD in math, and I was very happy when he uh, decided to join my lab and do a second PhD, which is very unusual in <laughs> neuroscience. I think he recognized the value in, in gaining a real hands-on approach, a hands-on understanding of how to do things like record synaptic transmission in the brain and look at behavior and he utilized and used his background in mathematics and modeling to uh, to model a number of complex problems in math and he did it he uh, it, was a, it was a great pleasure having him in the lab it was really a lot of fun and he, uh, he I think he moved the field forward quite a bit um, so I'm going to not take up any more time so that he can uh, get started and we have a little bit of time to discuss and ask questions afterwards. And uh, so at this point, I will turn it over to Dennis and welcome back. All right. Uh, thank you, Michael, for introducing me. Uh, I'm gonna turn on my video. So um, today we'll talk about artificial neural networks, optimization um, and their applications. Um, artificial neural networks uh, could be really uh, heavy on math to explain, so I did my best to avoid all the math. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I believe that you'll still have a great intuition of uh, how they were designed uh, and how they work. And then we'll go over how they use today uh, with their applications and also uh, mention uh, what uh, of those applications, applications I worked on uh, in my career. Uh, well, let's start with intuition. First, let's uh, stop for a little bit and think about uh, why we design models in general. It could be a statistical model, it could be a mathematical model, it could be some 
futuristic model that works inside our brain, um, we absorb data in the real world, world and then we uh, create a model that could possibly explain this data or probably uh, find some possible relationship between different variables in this data. And then we use this model to predict uh, what would happen if uh, we do something or if it just could happen in the future, etc. Um, <clears throat> and data could be data in the, in this scheme could be much more than just numbers we recorded uh, during the experiment or um, numbers that we uh, come up up somehow. It could be pretty general. For example, we have we could have a model that makes image label. We have an image uh, of something and we mark it as blueberries. And uh, we do this obviously in our head all the time, consciously and consciously. Um, another example could be a game strategy. So we have a position on the chessboard and then um, we
if you have functions that describes the firing of action potential for each neuron and we want to uh, like model the interaction between them, we will we'll go immediately go into the realm of differential equations uh, where we have at least one equation per neuron, maybe more. And right now, like big networks have millions of parameters, you can imagine like it becomes really computation heavy really fast. Um, so there is slightly less intuitive but uh, more efficient way to simulate uh, this in uh, this network uh, in our inside our computers. So instead of uh, modeling firing, we will model the frequency of uh, neurons fired. The frequency defines uh, the strength of the signal anyway. So there is like it's like next best thing we can do. Um, and in this case, you just one uh, if if we imagine that the system is stable and does not change, uh, then it will be just one number for one neuron. If this neuron would not fire the frequency two hertz, and this is this neuron fires uh, two times per second, oh, once in two seconds. Sorry. Um, so, and time immediately becomes uh, unnecessary because uh, it's just one number, and if it whatever it, uh, whenever it changes, it will be just uh, two numbers or small, anyway it will be a small set of numbers uh, because it fired once, everything happened it's one set of numbers for one number for each neuron it fires second time, something changed, uh, it's second number so it, it will be a small set of numbers which is much easier to store and work with rather than the function of time for each neuron um, now let's talk about how actually this thing would work. Like, uh, what is, you, as, you, as you remember now, model we have an input, uh, our data, and output, our prediction. So how this happens here? Uh, well, as in real world, we see something, or we smell something, or we perceive something, and it starts to activate in our neurons through our senses senses uh, inside our nervous system. And then something happening, some magic happening, and the system outputs uh, to our conscious that, look, it's a food. It's probably noodles. Um, so we can do the same uh, here. Uh, there, there are clearly some uh, neurons that respond to the input and some neurons that respond to high order of perception and then finally some neuron would or several neurons would output our decision that this is food, uh, probably tasty, uh, maybe it's plastic but looks like food, but whatever. Um, and if we go to extreme and, not to extreme, but simplify this for the sake of simplicity. <laughs> Sorry, simplify for the sake of simplicity, uh, but simplify it. Uh, we can get to a nice ordered system that has uh, so-called layers. First layer, second layer, third layer. Um, where first layer is just input for our data. Uh, that could be just some features, for example, whether it's solid or not. Uh, what's the color? Uh, what's the smell of this input? Uh, then internal layer where all computation and magic happening and we'll go over this. Uh, and finally last neuron or it could be several neurons would uh, give us a decision uh, what this is. Uh, and now let's like okay so, uh, color, smell, so like how do we put it inside inside this? What like we work with numbers, we work with colors, or what what, what do we work with? Um, and it's uh, when we go, uh, when we put in, we uh, provide an input for neural network, it goes uh, in this model, it goes from left to the right, so from inputs to outputs, and that's why it's called forward propagation, because it goes from beginning to the end. <laughs> um, oops, sorry, so for example, uh, solid, uh, where the is solid? Is not, could be represented by just two numbers. If it's solid, it's one. If it's not solid, it's zero. Uh, if it's color, uh, it's hard to represent color by one number, but 
Uh, there are several ways, several ways we can do this. Uh, for example, we can create a table uh, that where we arbitrarily assign some numbers uh, to some colors. And let's say 37 is yellow, so color is 37. Although this table is arbitrarily assigned, uh, once we assign it, we should keep it for this model. So it, it doesn't jump around and 37 would be always yellow uh, for this model. And finally, smell, uh, let's say just intensity of smell measured somehow, like, you know, like a number of particles for uh, some volume. Uh, and it's just some uh, field number. Obviously, uh, all those, this is not set as stone, we, have, we could have much more features or much less features, but we cannot build much less <laughs> than three. Um, but they all could be represented differently. For example, here we have color that is represented by just a single number, but we can actually, if we represent every color as uh, some amount of red, green, and blue, uh, then every color could be described by three numbers. Uh, and color would be, for example, uh, set of correspond to a set of three neurons. Uh, one corresponds to one neuron would correspond to intensity of red channel, uh, one to intensity in green, and another one in intensity in blue channel. And that would describe color as well. Um, okay, so we uh, we have our object. We converted it into numbers somehow uh, in a number of features. Uh, so okay, great. This is somewhat. Uh, understandable, but how we get from those numbers to understand it that this is good? Well, uh, this is where we start talking about what's happening in internal layer. Uh, and this is another um, another place where the artificial neural networks were inspired by, uh, clearly inspired by the real neurons. Uh, as you can see here, those arrows represent connections. Uh, those arrows represent connection. So, uh, what what happens when those neurons fire at, let's say, those frequencies? Uh, they will excite this neuron. Depending in real world, depending on where this uh, connection is happening, uh, whether it's in a distant dendrites or it's in a soma or in uh, it's a base of axon, uh, then. The strength of the single, the strength of the signal would be different, and this is. But then all those signals will be just uh, will integrate uh, together, and this neuron will decide whether it, it wants to fire or not. Actually, potentially, and this is what is happening here. We just get the weighted sum of all those inputs. Here, x one is the, uh, this number, x two is this number, and x three is this number. And A, B, and C are called weights, and they represent how strong is uh, the connection of those synapses with this neuron. So, if, for example, A is high, that means that connection from this neuron to this one is very strong. But, for example, if C is zero, that means that actually there is um, uh, there is no connection between those uh, two neurons. And if B is negative, that means that this uh, neuron actually acts in. Uh, actually inhibits the activity of this neuron. So uh, again, if you think about this for a moment, it becomes uh, more or less intuitive. So in this example, uh, it would be this A times 1, B times 37, C times 4.15, and I just pick some random numbers. So let's say A and B are 1, and C is 0, so the sum is 38. So the frequency of this neuron would be 38. And for some other numbers, uh, the frequency of this neuron would be 20. Now, a small remark in practice. Uh, we have here, we, we have a linear, linear function. In practice, it's not linear function, uh, but it's really close. For example, it could be a stop function. So if this number is above some threshold, then neuron will fire. And it's again, it's very intuitive, and this is what actually happens outside our brain. If you reach some threshold, uh, depolarized um, neuron will fire. Or uh, it could be sigmoid. Sigmoid function is a smooth step function. This step function is just uh, like, like the, uh, it's a step function is just a uh, flat line, vertical line, flat line. That sigmoid is small variation of this. 
and Trello is actually what is used in almost all real neural networks. Again, it just if it's if the number is above zero, it will output this number. If this number is below zero, it will output zero. So although they're not linear, it's like they're very close to linear functions. Okay, uh, this is the equation I had here in my presentation, so we passed that equations. Um, so okay, we have those frequencies, but what happens? Okay, um, what's happened next? Well, next happened exactly the same thing. We uh, sum, we integrate the sequence from this neuron here somehow and get some number. Okay, but how we get from this number to word food? We get, uh, we do exactly the same. We get do exactly the same as we did here. We just uh, we have a list of uh, list of uh, objects we can recognize. And let's say food is 18. So if this if the neural network output 18, then it's food. Um, okay, great. Now we know. Uh, now we know how basically forward propagation works, and it basically explains how to use neural network. If we have neural network that works and that out and it has uh, correct weights. Uh, it will, if we uh, provide an input for it, it will detect uh, what uh, object we looking or smelling uh, at right now. Uh, now the question is, how do we find those parameters? Because if the if those parameters are good ones, then our neural network would provide us with good results and will be more often right than the wrong. But if those Parameters are just random parameters, random numbers as here, as I put here, then it will be just random numbers. So it will be just not, uh, random numbers, and there was there will be no use of this uh, model. Well, uh, and this is where we talk about web propagation or simply training, and this is where we actually uh, can find out those parameters. This is a process uh, to find those parameters. Uh, so let's say we have a set of objects and we label them. So for example, we have a uh, so solid object, it's one, its color is red, and it smells pretty heavy with gasoline. Then it's probably a car. And so 1, 1, 1 1.5 that responds to 1, which is car here. Uh, or for example, um, we have zero, zero, zero. So it's not solid, it's transparent, and it has no smell. Well, maybe it's water. Well, not maybe. I know it's water because I labeled it. <laughs> uh, but basically, we have a, set, a data set that we will train our neural net. Basically, it's like a small child, and we provide him or her with a bunch of examples, and we say, OK, this is a car. And Suppose only uh, our child can read only those, read, I mean, like, take into his brain or her brain uh, only these features. Uh, and then we provide a bunch of examples, and neural network uh, should use those examples to train, to learn, to distinguish those things. And after we, pro uh, we, uh, we have this data set represented by numbers, we feed it into the neural net and we do an algorithm that goes by propagation. It includes a bunch of derivatives and um, math, so I will not go into details, but it's well known algorithm. If you're interested, I can provide more details. If you're interested and I'm not around, you can Google it. Uh, but it goes by, propag by propagation because basically you compute derivatives in the opposite direction from uh, and to the start, and that so it, it goes backward, and that's why backwards. That's why it's called backpropagation. So steps are: you find and co-create a uh, data set, then you initialize parameters, so weights of those neurons, the train, uh, weights of those neurons randomly, and then you feed the data set into the algorithm called gradient descent or backpropagation, as it were. 
with the repository, and you will find your parameters that uh, somewhat optimal. Uh, somewhat because you can, it will take a immense amount of time to find through optimal parameters, so it will be locally optimal. <coughs> but good enough parameters. Uh, so your neural network would do what you want it to do in most cases. And I'll tell you a funny story about how it's not always true. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so that's the whole idea about neural networks. So let's recap this. Uh, artificial neural networks are interconnected set of nodes. What it is. Each node represents a neuron, and each connection represents a synapse. And the track of connections is defined by, by nodes parameters called weights. And when we train neural net, it, uh, we change those weights, we change those parameters, and that's basically, you could think about brain plasticity when you think about this. Like we provide a bunch of examples to a child, and something happening, brain plasticity happens, some synapses are strengthened, some weakened uh, inside uh, the brain of a child, and he or she learns how to do stuff. And here it's basically the same. Um, <clears throat> so artificial neural networks work uh, with numbers. Uh, so data set must be represented numerically somehow. But I mean, if, it, if you can say it on your computer, it already represented numerically somehow. All your images represented as, like all that represent as sequences of bytes, zeros and ones. There might be some more convenient way to represent it differently and fit it in the neural net rather than just row of bytes, <coughs> row of bytes. but uh, this is like worst case scenario, if you say it on a computer, it can represent it numerically somehow. So this is not actually an issue, it's just like all like additional stuff you need to do. <coughs> um, artificial neural networks can be often represented as a one-directional or feed-forward system and uh, they could be like visualized in layers. That's uh, what we had. We had three, three layers, one input layer, one inner layer, layer, and one output layer. Uh, <clears throat> this is not always the case. That's why it's called often. Uh, sometimes we can have cycles and nonlinear uh, relation, not, I mean not linear, not one directional relationship between neurons and the same uh, in the same way we have it in our brain. Uh, but it's still what like when people publish papers, they still uh, they still try to represent it as a fit for system with some additional side chains or something like that. Uh, but it looks nice when it's one directional and more often than not you can see the general direction because there is clearly an input and there is clearly an output. Uh, in most cases. <laughs> uh, but as uh, technology goes more complicated, we start to build more complex uh, artificial net networks, so uh, rows become less and less strict because we're trying to do new things. But for intuition, you can always think about uh, neural networks uh, as one directional fit forward systems. Unless you design them, there is no reason not to think about them in that way. Um, and so neuron in a layer accepts the output of neurons from the previous layer as it, its input. So it takes all uh, synapses from uh, all signals from synapses uh, and then it implicates them somehow. Usually it's just linear function and some <coughs> step function or some modification of linear function and then it fires its own signal to the next layer. And this is just, that's it. This the intuition behind uh, artificial neural networks. Um, and finally, optimal parameters can be found by feeding a good data set into the backpropagation model. When I say about good, good data set, what by good data set. That basically means if uh, if the set, if examples you provide into the neural net are garbage, you'll get garbage out there as a result. Like garbage in, garbage out. It's like if you're trying to teach 
feature or something, and instead of providing good explanations, we provide in not good explanations. Uh, it's much harder for a child to learn. On that note, a funny, a funny story about this. So, uh, one, artif one artificial neural network uh, was built to uh, identify, uh, I think it was uh, makes of cars, uh, for example, if it's Nissan or BMW or something else. And uh, it was provided with a bunch of images of different cars uh, that was correctly labeled. Like this picture corresponds to BMW, this picture corresponds to Nissan, etc. Uh, and it ran for some time and it failed. And then it was producing strange results that were not correct. And uh, researchers tried to understand why that happened. Like data sets seems good, uh, design of the neural network seems good, it should work, it doesn't work, why? And then it turns out that all pictures provided, uh, all the cars were um, <coughs> photographed on the same background. And NeuralNet actually learned how to identify this background rather than cars. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, like sometimes you, you cannot influence, I mean, you can influence what uh, neural network learns but it will learn based on example you provide. So bad examples would result in bad model. Uh, not uh, like examples that have some, uh, that not this person up, not, um, but do not have enough variance between them, will uh, could lead some funny results as in the story I just made. So it almost always good idea uh, to check your data set if your neural net does not do what it needs to be doing. Okay, and finally, usefulness. Like, okay, well, we have the structure, but uh, we, we got the idea how it works, how we can build one, but how it actually performs. So, even the simplest artificial neural net that consists of only one input and output uh, model with step function uh, is identical to logistic regression. So it can give some data uh, to be linearly separated. The smallest uh, artificial neural net can do this. And if we increase number of layers in neurons, then we can approximate any continuous function, like any, this neural net. Uh, and if we apply more different architectures, then we can do crazy stuff. And we'll talk about this in our uh, examples. Uh, yeah, I just said that. And sometimes they even could outperform humans in certain tasks. In general, uh, it's relatively easy to, if your artificial neural net performs uh, worse than human, it's relatively easy to bump it up to human performance level. And the reason is because you're human, you can go look at the data set and look at the examples that your network does not perform well and uh, think about how you can fix it. So, for example, if you're trying to, if you're supplying pictures of dogs and cats to the neural net and it mistakes small dogs or cats, you can try to think, uh, you can provide more examples of small dogs versus cats. And then it will learn that, oh, those actually a bunch of small creatures are not always cats, like dogs could be dogs as well. Uh, I did not know, like, I did know that now. So it's really easy, relatively easy, not really easy, but relatively easy to find uh, reason why your artificial neural net uh, performs under the human uh, level of performance. But after that, it becomes harder and harder because, well, we don't know what's wrong because we can do this. <laughs> uh, it's like trying to teach something you don't know. It becomes uh, difficult. But sometimes we can achieve this. Um, so it's expensive to collect data and train neural net. Like uh, the biggest neural nets cost uh, like millions of dollars to train, just because of the electricity they spend and computational power. But they, after they train, they're relatively cheap to use because to use them you just need to do forward propagation and you just um, matrix multiplication, which is 
really easy to do. Uh, it's really hard to compute derivatives, relatively hard to compute derivatives. So it's expensive to train, but to use it, it's really easy. And that's why, for example, uh, Google could spend millions of dollars uh, or Apple could spend million of, million of dollars on training neural nets uh, to be your personal assistant, like Alexa or Siri. Uh, but then you can run it on your phone or even on small device that has almost no computational power whatsoever. So it's very cheap in terms of even computational power to run. Uh, complete neural nets, and it's fast, so you can like, talk to your Alexa in real, uh, in real time. It doesn't take hours to explain. <laughs> uh, so now we go over the applications, unless you have any questions uh, about the intuition. Um, I mean, I, I was just curious on, when you were talking about the, the neurons and the, you were assigning them numbers, mm -hmm. which you are arbitrary, I know, but um, each brain in a subject has to learn and then organize their own neurons. So do you see any similarities in different subjects, how they organize? Uh, yes, so when you design a uh, neural net, uh, you, design, you usually design, like at least it, it used to be, <laughs> you design the, uh, the structure. So you, you decide which neurons, uh, how many layers, how they connect it. Um, if every neuron connects to every neuron in the next layer, maybe like it's not they connect to some of the neurons in the next layer. Um, and then you supply examples and it learns weights. And depending on weights, it could be like if it's if the weight is zero, then obviously you don't need this connection. Uh, but relative, relatively recently, so design you decide on design, and then it's like you like. Uh, you create the brain, and then brain tries to learn with whatever connections it has. But recently, there was some methods that allow you that allow the system to change its structure um, to some extent. So this, I could I, I, I could say that it's not it's not longer true. Uh, so the, uh, some of those would like truly change the structure and connections. Uh, between uh, how they're designed. Now, obviously, different designs will produce different results. Um, oops, wrong direction. Uh, so, for example, this this neural net is very shallow in terms of has very few layers and very few neurons. It probably will not identify anything well because it's just like six neurons. And you need maybe a few hundred or thousand to identify uh, simple pictures. So obviously, different design would lead to different results, and that's where the whole complexity of neural net comes in. Like, uh, what's the best designs to uh, for this particular problem? Uh, how would you tweak it? Uh, what is the best approaches? What is the most time efficient approach? Because you don't have a year to wait for you to train and money. You need it by Monday, plus <laughs> <laughs> uh, So this is where it becomes complex, basically. But uh, different neural nets produce different results, even if we use the same data set. It's like, even if we teach the same stuff in school for several kids, they still understand it differently because their brains are different. Mm -hmm. And sometimes differently is not better or worse. Uh, sometimes it's just different. You mean, you don't mean the output is different. You mean the structure of the network. Structure is different, output could be different. For example, the, uh, some neural nets would be, like for example, dogs and cats pictures. Uh, some neural nets could perform uh, better on small dogs and distinguish them better than other networks. But this other network, network could distinguish like fuzzy or blurred pictures better. For example. Um, so the short answer is it all depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. And don't worry. I mean, you can ask questions about the now, but don't worry.
inventory of us components. You can ask some questions of them. Um, okay, uh, unless there are any other questions, I'll move to applications. Uh, so I tried to put them into somewhat categories, uh, somewhat categories that make sense, but they, a lot of them overlap, so uh, it just uh, it's not strict categories. So first we start with visual, visual applications. This was done uh, like in '93 by uh, Jan Lukun. This is a very famous guy in the uh, in uh, deep learning and artificial neural networks. And basically, what it does, it recognizes handwritten uh, numbers. Uh, 
so this is pretty good um, for yourself. And actually, like, uh, it could be, for example, I know that in China it could be used as a, you don't need ID card to enter some secure building, they could use this to, uh, your face recognition to enter, but uh, unlike in this example, you cannot use just static photo, it will recognize that it's photo in a real person, and will not let you in by the photo, but it will, if you like, present your face, it will let you in. So that's additional cool stuff. Uh, synthesis, so these people are not, they do not exist. This, uh, those uh, photos are generated. So this could be useful, for example, if you need stock images, or you need like, use something in advertisement, and you don't want to pay actors or get permission, you can just now generate faces and they cannot tell that those are not real people at all. That they, they seem real. And you can see how it's not like it works well for white middle aged dudes, it, it works well across uh, many variations of uh, high, high diversity of uh, examples. Um, on that note, you probably heard about your fate. So this is when you you can actually not, uh, you can Photoshop their, not Photoshop because it's done on video, but change the uh, face of a person on the video. This is uh, what I was I, I was working on a little bit for working with. So basically, uh, you have a video of an animal, and uh, you want to track some. You have hundreds of video, hours of video, and you want to track some behavior. And you can teach neural net on like like on few on very few examples, like on a minute video, how to do that for your particular case and then analyzes the video and you can see how it tracks everything and now you can don't have to sit and watch how this mice interacted with this mice or this deck interacted with this deck and you could just now put this in computer and say okay well when they're close together then I want to uh, look at the video if they're far apart I know they're not there. That. so that saves a bunch of time and you can see how it works on uh, So there is like the tail, like the, the 
back end of it, uh, the client disappears. Uh, and uh, it's like it says, it's not on a picture, which is correct. And I think it's very cool because basically learns and understands 3D, not like just 2D movement, like here, but like 3D motions as well, which is just insane for me. And they recently they updated this. This is free to use, by the way. Uh, they recently updated, so they used not to be able to track several, well, not perform well on several uh, animals as the same in one picture, but now they work well and they interact, and that's, that's just great. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so next are big chunk of examples, uh, natural language processing. Uh, for example, the most uh, well known probably are sentiments. So for example, you can, uh, you can read reviews and you can mark them as positive, negative, or uh, neutral. Uh, and this is like, in those examples, those are very simple examples that's very easy to use without even artificial neural nets because great movie, great, good word, it's positive review. Not great, negative review. Nothing of the, uh, no, none of these words, it's probably natural. But there are, then there are some examples when, like, uh, like this, when the negation is very far in sentence from the positive word, but it's still negative review. And that's, what we, uh, that's where we need that. Sentiments could be used, uh, they're heavily used in trading uh, by trading companies because some use pop up. Uh, you don't need to read the review, uh, natural language processing, uh, neural net, reads the review and says, okay, it's positive review, the price will go up, let's buy it before anybody else can. Uh, it's negative review, let's, uh, let's sell it for short and before it goes down. Because, that, as I said, uh, it's really cheap to use those after they train, so it's and it's really fast, probably faster than you can read the title. <laughs> uh, so yeah, another one is translation, Google Translate. Uh, it uses natural pro uh, language processing, uh, artificial neural net to do that, because you cannot just translate word to word. You need to arrange them somehow uh, to make the sentence. Like I know for sure that some. If I translate some words, some uh, some sentences word to word from Russian to English, I will be speaking uh, as Yoda at best. <laughs> uh, and that's why actually Yoda does not sound that strange in Russian because like okay, I mean it's people do not talk, talk like that, but it's still grammatically correct. <laughs> uh, audio, uh, as I said, personal assistants like Siri or Alexa. Uh, you talk to them, they uh, activate when you say hey Siri or hey Alexa or whatever the good words and they could do what you told them. Uh, music composition. So this was done in 2018, so some time has passed, passed, they do crazy stuff right now, but this uh, this was done, like this music was composed by a machine. Because 
if this happens once uh, in a day, you don't want to get ding 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 every hour or every minute. Uh, so there is a balance between making false negative or false positive outputs. Another example of anomaly detection, and that's what I was working on in my last company, is equality detection uh, using EEG data. Uh, it's very time consuming to find EEGs, and there are no good solutions to find them automatically. Usually, like the gold standard is people sit in front of the computer and go through hours of recordings and try to find seizures by hand. And even then, it's like I think there was one study when they supplied the same data for the same person twice, but like on different occasions, like uh, there's some hours in between, like maybe a day or something, a few hours, and it was really poor consistency between those marks. So even it's poor consistency between uh, specialists, but it's not very good consistency in marking markings, uh, even within one specialist. Uh, so this is what it looked like, and it was presented from a poster uh, in IS 2020, like we have a G data, and this is like uh, clearly seizures, clearly uh, and yeah, this is application that we were building. Uh, strategies, namely games. Uh, so you probably heard about chess and Go. So like those are news from 2016, how AlphaGo, the neural net from Google, outplays uh, champion, uh, champions in Go, which has much more, uh, it's like, right now it's impossible to compute all possible moves in Go because it's there are just too many. Uh, all possible chess moves were computed some time ago, so it's like a solved game, but Go is not. And another, in 2000, uh, ex another example from 2019, uh, Dota 2 is a computer game. It's a very complex computer game uh, from the point of view how to learn play. There are like it's a team based, so you need the interaction between team players. And there are like I don't know more than hundred or so hundred of different characters that are different, and you can play as any of them and they interact between each other differently. And there are a bunch of other stuff going on. There are much more possible moves in this game than in Go. And now that defeats world champions. So in real time, obviously. So it's uh, fascinating. Uh, and finally, final example that I'll give you is physics simulation. Um, so it's when you simulate something on your computer, it's really expensive uh, if you go through complex uh, examples. And artificial neural nets make it much easier and cheaper. So here's the video. In this example, our method realistically reproduces the surface tension weakening effect caused by surface active constituents in milk. This is real image, this is simulation. You can see how it sinks through the milk but falls on a uh, water is real, and this is simulated. In, in this example, paper clips with traffic. increasingly higher density than that of water keep afloat on the surface of the water. And you can see how this different density is slightly different. Uh, light distortion. Our algorithm can also reproduce the Cheerios effect, which occurs when floating objects attract one another. Unstable balance between the object and the liquid surface. But it is crashing, so it's simply. The last two examples show the generality of our framework. First, two leaves and a boat, all represented as thin shells, float on water, causing dynamic motion.
small bicycle assembly. Yeah, crazy stuff. Uh, thank you, and that's all the examples. Looks like you might have a message in chat, maybe, I don't know. Maybe a question. Ourselves basically, but in silicon base or I think that would be it's not realized yet. We're not close to this yet, unfortunately. Even like because we don't have computational power to create that many neurons that we have in our brain uh, in a computer, but this is definitely where it would be the greatest achievement of humankind. Based on movies, maybe we should do this, maybe not. Uh, but it would be a achievement nevertheless. So there's a, there's kind of a lot of discussion about that idea of potentially AI evolving to a point where it, it exceeds the capacity of human intelligence to a degree we can't even imagine. Yes, uh, given our like rudimentary models right now, as I said, outperforms us in some models, like for example, persistence. Uh, but other things like, for example, specialized neural nets could distinguish between pictures of cats and dogs better than human can do right now. And I would have, like, I was interested interested in those such examples like, okay, what what's a picture of a cat and dog I cannot distinguish? And it's just a very blurry picture, or very small, like the size of the pixel. You just like you can see that this is a uh, quadrupedal animal. You cannot say. It's hard to say if it's human or if it's, uh, you can say it's not human, but if it's a uh, dog, whether it's dog or a cat, and artificial neural can do this. There are some examples uh, when uh, you can see cancer or scans, like those artificial neural nets can make less mistake than actual doctors in this experience. Um, yeah, so there are a bunch of examples when neural nets outperform uh, human already now, so I can see how it, it goes in that it can go in that direction really relatively easy. Unless we bump with the some basic uh, law of nature that we don't know about or we don't know of yet. So I guess are there any other questions? Yeah. If you're trying to convert uh, the, ne the neuron, neuron system, which has multiple, multiple, you know, combinations of numbers to ones and zeros mm -hmm. to a computer. Is that like a three-dimensional array in the computer? Uh, yes, but not in the form you think of it. <laughs> uh, some neural nets uh, have, have, like we, now example, we have one D layers and each layer just like some like three neurons or ten neurons or whatever. Um, but uh, most, like not most of the ones, like almost all uh, neural nets, they have three dimensional or three dimensions or more in one layer. Uh, the good intuition about this would be we have a picture. Picture is 3D. Oh, picture is 2D. Uh, and if you want to supply it into the neural net, uh, if it's not black and white picture, then it has at least three colors. I mean, three colors, RGB, or red, uh, green, and blue. So it will make it, so two dimensions would be the size of the picture, and 
big more would, um, would be third dimension, would be like the Koichi channel, color channel. Uh, if you're thinking about, so this is how, and some maybe like videos would have 40 because like in bigger pictures don't have that length. Um, what uh, about what probably you think about this like more physical 3D modeling? And it's less in the, real, in the realm of artificial neural nets, it's more in the realm of uh, modeling the brain. There are some artificial neural nets that do not use this certification that I show you, they actually use uh, the uh, differential equations to model the firing of uh, neurons. And I haven't heard about 3D modeling of neurons because it would be really uh, computationally heavy. But I think someone did this. Someone, I am sure someone did this and just did not share. Maybe because uh, our computational powers are not there yet to make it effective. Uh, so basically, in terms of 3D structure, everything is, uh, goes down to right now all simplified to the strength of connection between synapses and neurons. And those are represented by weights. Well, we're uh, out of time. I hope uh, if, you have have additional additional video, uh, if you have additional questions, I, mean, I have some time after the presentation, you can stay in the Yeah. Okay, well, join me in thanking.